Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us, especially on a, a day that's kind of rainy and overcast. Uh, really appreciate the interests and uh, the, the efforts you've made to join us and uh, uh, apologize for the cramped accommodations, but I think it says something about the interest of uh, the topic that brings us together. Uh, my name is Peter Fahm. I'm, I serve as Vice President for Research and Regional Initiatives and Director of the Africa Center here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm here in that guise, not any other guise that I may currently also have uh, because there's not enough to do here that I keep a second job. Uh, we're delighted to host this timely discussion on Sudan's economy with His Excellency Dr. Ibrahim El Badawi, the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Sudan. Before I invite the minister to the stage to give his remarks, permit me to say a few words about the Africa program here at the Atlantic Council and our longstanding body of work on the U.S.-Sudan relationship. The Africa Center was founded 10 years ago uh, by former National Security Advisor General Jim Jones uh, with a mission to promote dynamic geopolitical partnerships with African states and to help shape U.S. and European policy priorities to strengthen security, promote economic growth and prosperity on the continent. And it was with that mission and in that context that uh, promoting constructive leadership and engagement in international affairs that the Atlantic Council's Africa Center supported and collaborated with a number of public and private sector organizations trying to forge practical solutions to some of the challenges and opportunities in Africa. And in particular, uh, thanks to our board member who's here present, uh, Ambassador Mary Yates, we uh, happened onto the question of Sudan and how after almost 20 years of strained relationships, uh, we might rethink U.S.-Sudan policy to better serve both America's interests and the lives of ordinary Sudanese citizens. With this end, in 2015, we started a Sudan task force, uh, began with a trip that uh, Mary and I took to Khartoum and later on expanded with, and I'm glad to see Ambassador Tim Carney, the last Senate-confirmed U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Sudan. Uh, uh, hopefully, one day, inshallah, we'll have a successor to you in that role. Uh, uh, we started this Sudan task force, which over the course of two years published four reports outlining recommendations for the U.S. government's re-engagement efforts. Uh, some copies of those now historical documents are outside if you're interested. But what we do is we gathered a bunch of minds from the policy community, from academia, from diplomacy, uh, to think, rethink that relationship. Uh, and I think we made our contribution to that over the last few years and have seen some of the fruits of that. And certainly, we, none of us, though, saw what we had coming this year, and which are quite extraordinary events this year. Uh, and to cope with that, we brought one of our members of our task force team, Cameron Hudson, who's known to many of you uh, very well. Cameron uh, is no uh, stranger to Sudan. He served as uh, chief of staff to the Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, uh, worked at the National Security Council, and worked at other port, uh, places uh, on Sudan. And we brought him on to organize a number of closed door discussions during a critical time this spring and to continue our efforts. Uh, and so I'll hand it over to Cameron uh, to moderate the discussion afterwards. But before that, let me invite His Excellency Dr. Ibrahim al Badawi to the podium. His Excellency is the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Sudan, having been sworn into that position by Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdak last month as part of the civilian-led transitional government. It begins its monumental task of rebuilding an economy after decades of, if we're, we're frank, mismanagement. Uh, Dr. El Badawi is no stranger to Washington, having spent more than two decades working at the World Bank as the lead economist for the Development Research Group. And before joining the bank, he had a distinguished career in academia, 
working as an associate professor of economics at the University of, of the Jazeera in Sudan. And with that, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Dr. Ibrahim El Badawi to the podium. Mr. Minister, the podium is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me. Can you hear me? It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon uh, at the Atlantic Distinguished uh, Institute, the Atlantic Council. Uh, I will be speaking about briefly to give you the broad outline of our vision for the economy of Sudan, which uh, I would argue is perhaps uh, as important as, uh, or perhaps only second to achieving peace. But then even if you achieve peace without fixing the economy, peace will not likely to be sustainable. So we took a perspective of a 10 year program, which we call Sudan Economic Revival Plan 2020-2030 uh, that goes with the acronym SERP 2020-2030. And then in order to actually make a case for this, we'll have to answer the, uh, uh, so, so, you, know, you know, some sort of a skeptical perspective as to why would a country uh, that's coming out from the ashes of uh, uh, an authoritarian predatory state that ruled for 30 years would aspire to talk about a 10-year plan. Uh, in economics, we know that actually you cannot work in silos. You cannot really just say, okay, I'm going to deal with the, the crisis through a rescue pl a plan for one year or two years, and then other people will t pick that up and, and continue. It's very important actually to design the rescue plan, which we call phase one, which covers the three years of the uh, mandate of the transitional government, uh, but also have to lay the foundation for further uh, sustainable economic development. The first phase is, is mainly aimed at igniting growth. And Economic growth actually gets ignited much easier than sustaining growth. So igniting growth requires dealing with major distortions in the macroeconomy and in the institutions. At the macroeconomic level now, just to give you a few examples, we inherited an economy with only 6% public revenues to GDP, while the average for Africa is more than 12%. And in many countries, a few countries like uh, Kenya, since the 90s, the state has been able to collect in revenues, public revenues, more than 20% uh, with reasonable tax rate. The reason being is because you need to have public resources to spend on uh, education and health and social services. And that is why the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department defines a fragile state as a state that could not collect 15% of GDP. Uh, in our case, it's not only that we don't have, the, the state did not have resources, but also the priorities were actually misguided. Uh, and that's why we inherited an economy with more than 60% inflation, uh, almost a free falling exchange rates and explosive uh, situation so much so that the uh, uh, purchasing power and the welfare of the population have suffered considerably. Uh, externally, we all know the heavy baggage that we inherited uh, from the old regime through its mischief in terms of international relations and support of terrorism. Uh, despite this glorious and peaceful revolution, Sudan continues to be listed as a terrorist state simply because we are living in the shadow of the SST. And this is another crippling, in fact, uh, uh, impediment to our ability to resuscitate the economy and establish a course 
that would allow us to access resources. Obviously, we have to do things ourselves, and we have already started. In fact, just yesterday, I received a very considerable uh, report reviewing the tax system and trying to close the loopholes and exemptions that the uh, former regime instituted in order to run its parallel state. The 6% revenue to GDP is not because the state uh, was incapable of uh, mounting it. In fact, the Sudanese population were actually um, um, suffering from overtaxation and surcharges and ad hoc, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, fees and so on. But simply because the state was running a parallel budget and a parallel system, and uh, it's having more serious than the usual deep state. But uh, we are dealing with that, and I think we are making progress. Uh, that is in this first phase, which we call the rescue. But then, in the second phase, before I come for the rest of my time to speak about the first phase, because that is the one that is of most interest to us, that we aimed actually to finish the process of broad-based institutional reforms that would allow us to stabilize growth at a reasonably high uh, altitude once we establish our altitude. And then in the, la in the, in the last four years of the 10-year program, we hope that with the participation of the youth which, uh, who constitute 60% of the population and who are the most amenable actually to uh, embody and, and, and take through uh, and move forward with the digital uh, technology that is shaping the global economy, actually to structurally to transform the economy into a high productivity knowledge-based economy. It's very important actually to set out this national economic narrative in order to actually uh, invigorate a sense of hope, a realistic hope that the future is bright, but then to be able to reach that future, we need actually to entertain and need to make significant sacrifices. But we will actually work very hard so that these sacrifices are tenable. And I like to, uh, to compare this with uh, an operation somebody undergoing an operation. Uh, some countries uh, that uh, might have uh, you know, embraced uh, a misguided nationalism to say, no, we don't need anybody. We will do it ourselves and so on. And experiences suggest that this like somebody taking an operation without anesthesia. So because of the pain halfway, they will have to abort the, the operation. Some other countries, would actually, if they found, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if everybody loves them and they found a lot of support, they take the anesthesia and forget about the operation. So once the anesthesia is over, <laughs> the pain remains. But the other successful countries, the third example of successful countries, they took the anesthesia and they took the operation and they prepared themselves, meaning that they own the program. And these are the successful countries. We hope to be so. So we have a vision. And this vision, as I said, is composed of three phases. Uh, let us me now focus on the fairest phase. The fairest phase really is that, uh, as, as the saying goes, charity starts at home. We are working very hard in, to improve our institutions. Mm -hmm. We are going to establish an independent uh, authority, investment authority, to review all the investment laws, uh, hope, uh, eventually reaching a, a one-stop shop, uh, you know, license we, uh, licensing window. Uh, we are also going to establish uh, an authority on civil service reform to ensure that we address all the distortions in the civil service. We are also going to uh, establish uh, or to launch a um, population census, which is very important for election, but also important for planning, as well as an agricultural census. And for us as an agricultural economy, the last census uh, done was in, uh, in the mid 70s. We are also going to uh, uh, you know, establish an, an independent authority on Sudanese identity, biometric identity, delivery services, and in order to deploy the kind of avenues to, uh, to, pro to create employment for youth, 
Uh, in fact, just the agricultural census and the population census will provide about 50,000 jobs for use and training so that they can actually uh, carry this for the next two to three years. Uh, we are very keen actually about uh, the conflict affected regions. Uh, in fact, the Ministry of Finance is in the process of launching a development fund for peace. This development fund for peace will engage uh, not only traditional development partners, but also humanitarian assistance uh, actors. Because we think and we believe that in many areas in Darfur and southern Kurdufan and, and, and southern Bulu Nile, it's a time now to transit even at least partially to transit from humanitarian assistance to sustainable development. Provide uh, resettling IDPs, resolving uh, land disputes, and uh, uh, you know, building livelihood, sustainable livelihood through agriculture, uh, uh, reforming uh, the health delivery and education delivery systems, and investing uh, in these regions in order to demonstrate the commitment to peace, which the government is already making in a very significant way, as, as you might have heard uh, in Juba now, uh, the top leaders of the government uh, flocked to Juba to support the process. And we think that uh, on the economic side, we need to, 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 uh, to, to do our bit in order actually to, uh, uh, to reinforce the, the, the political initiative of the peace process. Uh, youth unemployment is also a major concern for us, and that's why we think that uh, training youth and also deploying them for urban services, and we have outlined about 20 projects that we think would be, uh, uh, should be assigned high priorities by our partners uh, in the Friends of Sudan. Uh, also modernizing agriculture, starting with what we call the low-hanging fruits uh, in uh, livestock uh, export. You know, uh, we think that we can move very fast in terms of, uh, uh, you know, investment in uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, and these slaughterhouses, fortunately, will be in the production area in the Gum Arabic and Red and Rainfed Agriculture Belt and uh, they could be linked to leather industry and improving the uh, air transport. Uh, for example, the airport of the second largest city, Niala, can actually provide considerable uh, contribution uh, to the uh, modernization of agriculture through exporting livestock uh, to, uh, you know, uh, you know um, uh, exporting meat and meat processing products to places like Nigeria and Algeria and even Europe, we already know there is a very high demand for uh, for uh, Sudanese meat. Uh, places in Kurdufan, cities in Kurdufan can actually be a base for exporting, uh, you know, um, uh, slaughtered uh, sheep to markets in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. We are also in this 2020 budget. We plan also to uh, open bids for uh, BOT to refined oil seeds uh, as well as gum arabic and i know this is of particular interest to american companies for example uh, horticulture in the nuba mountains and the uh, 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 and the river uh, river river nile state and northern northern state and kassel state so the agricultural diversity uh, hold tremendous potential uh, for us even while we are uh, thinking about economic reforms and stabilizing the macroeconomy is actually to add value and to jump start this. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, a potential for positioning Sudan to be an entry port and developing the Red Sea coast in order to facilitate investment, large scale investment on uh, railway networks and road networks to service the economy of Sudan, as well as the four landlocked countries around us, uh, Republic of South Sudan, Ethiopia, Central African Republic, and Chad. There is a huge potential there for, for Sudan. I think the agriculture, the youth, and the strategic location, the geography of Sudan, these are the three strategic comparative advantages of the economy of Sudan. Finally, let me uh, speak about 
the commodity subsidies, which is uh, a very touchy and important issue, because we cannot really do any economic reforms without reforming the commodity subsidy. Right now, the share of just the petroleum uh, subsidy on petroleum products accounts for 8% of the GDP, while the combined allocation to education and health in the central budget is less than 5%. The message that we are going to convey to our youth and to our population is that you have a choice. Either we take a decision to not to mortgage the future of uh, our uh, youth uh, and to miss the, the digital revolution uh, and to miss the potential of the Sudanese economy and live our means uh, beyond our means as well as they are kind brothers in, in the Gulf and other friends who are willing to foot the bill. Uh, unless we wanted to actually do that, we have to take action. And the action we plan to do, I think, is well thought and very compassionate and the right thing. Rather than subsidizing uh, petroleum products for the middle income and upper middle income in Khartoum and other cities who own cars and and, 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 and houses and so on, let us actually live to our ideals of the revolution of peace, freedom, and justice. Because this is really the iconic slogan of the revolution, is, uh, is uh, freedom, peace, and justice. If you really want freedom, peace, and justice, let us actually think about allocating resources to those who need it. And the program that we are working on at the time when we unify the exchange rate, to ensure that actually the inflation pass through from unifying the exchange rate uh, is not significant. For those of us who knows macroeconomics, there is something called exchange rate overshooting. Because when you have an official exchange rate and uh, a market parallel exchange rate, and you want to unify, the exchange rate will likely to overshoot in the short run. So to avoid a very significant steep overshooting or an extended period of overshooting, we have to reform the fiscal policy. We have to have some uh, improvement in the fiscal policy stance. And we also have to have some measure of reserve, like three to four months of imports uh, as reserves for the central bank. And then we take the exchange rate unification. But then, even then, there will be an immediate rise in the cost of living, uh, especially for the vulnerable groups. So what we plan to do is the following, is actually to design uh, almost like uh, a universal, partial universal income transfers, uh, which will cover like about half of the Sudanese population. Because our estimate now is that the poverty rate is 65% which is, or more than that, which is very significant. So you, you can only target the rich, you cannot target the poor. <laughs> so what we plan to do is to, uh, is to take the schools at the sampling frame and deploy the youth who will be well-trained and well-organized to go to each and every school in Sudan, each and every school, high school, elementary school, and middle school, and to actually ask some questions uh, about whether there is a pregnant woman in the household, whether the number of children who are less than five years old and the number of pupils who actually enrolled in schools, plus a geographic targeting. Uh, and I have been in discussion even today, this morning with uh, our colleague at the World Bank uh, about how we can design this uh, and to deploy a very experienced team from the World Bank to help us on this. And then uh, we are also reviewing the, 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 the mobile money and the cash transfer system because we don't want any intermediaries. Uh, we want to transfer money directly to the beneficiary without any intermediaries. And we think this will revolutionize the Sudan. This will actually be a very focused uh, sustainable development goal uh, budget because it will focus on education and on health. And also, it will uh, lead to financial deepening because uh, hopefully the requirement is that at least people living in the urban centers will have to have a uh, bank's account. Uh, so we think that we will have a communication strategy 
that is hopeful, but is also realistic, transparent, and it will respect the use of the Sudan because they pride themselves that their revolution is peaceful, but it's also a revolution of awareness. And when I go back from here, I intend to hold uh, dialogues and discussions with the stakeholders from all walks of life. Uh, and, and, and then we will take into account whatever feedback we will have. And we hope to succeed because we think that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this economic program is really a very important instrument for sustaining uh, the process of democratic trans uh, tra uh, tra transformation. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to say that the images of the ambassador, the US ambassador, uh, mingling with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the use uh, at the sit, uh, at the sit in, in front of the high command, the army high command, have sent very assuring message to those of us at the time I was living in Cairo, that we have friends, we have powerful friends. And I think also now we need our US friends and partners to support the Sudanese economy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. Uh, my name is Cameron Hudson. I'm a senior fellow here in the Africa Center. Uh, and I am sharing in Peter's comments earlier about how thrilled I am to see so many of you here today. Uh, and frankly, so many uh, Sudan hands, uh, familiar faces, friends of Sudan. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And uh, firstly, thank you to the minister for his remarks very comprehensive. I suspect that after a week of World Bank and IMF meetings, you've uh, you've got you found your rhythm, uh, and so that was that was clear today. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, before we turn to the panel discussion, I want to do a brief um, introduction of those uh, envoys joining me on the panel, um, and I think it's significant uh, to note that. Um, a collection of Troika envoys has been working on Sudan or South Sudan since I looked it up on the State Department website, June of 2001, uh, predating uh, our own first special envoy to Sudan, John Danforth. And I think it's a, uh, a testament to the strength of the transatlantic relationship um, and the importance of Sudan uh, that our governments have committed so many diplomatic resources uh, and so much time from their diplomats uh, to peace in Sudan. And so whether it's been in Machakos or in Naivasha or in uh, Nuba or in Darfur or in uh, Juba, uh, since many of you have in the past or now still cover South Sudan, um, I just think it's a testament to the strength of the transatlantic relationship in Africa and in Sudan um, in particular. Uh, so first, uh, sitting uh, to the minister's left is uh, Ambassador Don Booth. Uh, you will all know Ambassador Booth from his previous role as Special Envoy to Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, I guess your penance is that you're back again for one more for one more round. For right, exactly. <laughs> I'll take that as a promotion, actually. Um, but uh, previous to that, uh, Ambassador, Su Ambassador Booth served as the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Ethiopia, the U.S. Ambassador to Zambia, and the U.S. Ambassador to Liberia, among, among many other diplomatic appointments. Uh, next to him is His Excellency Julian Riley. Um, Julian is the United Kingdom's Special Envoy for the Red Sea and Horn of Africa, with responsibility as well for Sudan. Previously, he held senior positions in the FCO, including tours of duty at the British Embassy in Khartoum and the High Commission in Nairobi, as well as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Riyadh. Uh, and at the end of our panel is Endra Stiansen, who is the Norwegian Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, uh, again, 
Angela, for all of his many sins, he has been called back into service uh, as Norway's uh, special envoy to Sudan and South Sudan. You didn't escape that one. Um, and prior to that, uh, he served as the senior research and policy advisor at the United Nations Development Program in Oslo, in the Oslo Government Center. So um, I want to thank you all again for being here uh, and for your commitment to the issue. Uh, I'm going to give the minister just a second to catch his breath and have some water and, and pose my first question uh, to the envoys who have had the opportunity um, to hear your remarks. Um, I want to recall a, an envoy statement, a Troika statement that was made over the course of the summer when the outcome of the revolution in Sudan wasn't quite uh, as clear as it has, has become in, in recent weeks and months, when the Troika said that it hoped to engage a civilian-led government as it works to achieve the Sudanese people's aspirations for responsive governance, peace, justice, and development. So I think we have such a government in place right now uh, under Prime Minister um, Hamduk. I want to ask you all, what is the role, sort of to open us up, what is the role that your governments can play in supporting um, peace, justice, and development in Sudan? What are your priorities um, going forward? And I'll, why don't we start at the end and work our way towards here. So Enda. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start before I answer the question to say it is great to see so many people here. It's almost as much interest in the Sudan in America as it is in Norway. <laughs> so that's very encouraging and I think that is a testimony to you know, hard work done by, by uh, colleagues here and, and everywhere and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, you know, our commitment to the Sudan goes back a long, long way for all of us. Uh, it's very much there, and even though the uh, minister didn't say it, I can say it. Our commitment is to make the Sudan great again. <laughs> we uh, we have you know a role in that, but I think as the minister made so clear, it's very much the role for the Sudanese. So our role then is to support, and we have to support in every way we can. But I think that we should first and foremost be be uh, observant, you know, be respectful of the goals of the revolution, you know, and, and as was said, you know, it was freedom, freedom first and foremost, and freedom is also an economic issue. Then it's peace. Peace definitely has, you know, an economic side, and I think that the ongoing peace negotiations in Juba is a very, very good test of seeing how kind of structural reform, uh, uh, restructuring of the Sudan the government is willing to undertake. And I think if you don't, you know, are bold in, in taking that forward, uh, you will again return to many of these issues in the future and it has to be dealt with in a constructive manner, in a manner that breaks with the past, and we will, of course, support uh, you in, in your efforts on that. Then the last is, is, is um, justice. Justice, I think, was also referred to by the minister in, th in, in very much in relation to the injustices of the economy in the past. It wasn't that it was necessarily very well, it was lots of prosperity in the Sudan, but it was so skewed. It was uh, one of the most unequal economies uh, known, and where you know the, some people made uh, tremendous fortunes, some some groups in society you know corner the economy, and it'll take a long time to undo that. And that justice element is also important, and we can support in that. More concretely, I think that we have to help the Sudan in doing what they can do now not to wait for you know the uh, the long term but focus on the short term domestic resource mobilization is is critical uh, as you have uh, talked about we should also be helping you on the structural reforms that needs to be taken. We should look for ways to increase the uh, amount available to you through uh, debt relief at, at a certain point, uh, certainly. And Norway will be part of that. We will see how we can expand some of the strategic programs we have. Uh, that is, uh, we have a program for all oil for development. It will enable you to get more out of resources. We are doing that also in South Sudan because we believe that's a sector that is, you know, what's good for South Sudan in that sector is good for you. What's good for you in, in that sector is, is good for South Sudan. So collaboration here is critical for the prosperity of both countries. It will give us peace in both countries, but we can work with you on that. And then we're also looking at other issues. We also have, I don't know if it's a very popular program, but it's called 
tax for development. Uh, so we we can look at you know how you can reform your uh, tax structure so that you can increase your domestic revenue policy. All of that you know things we can do now. Uh, we want to do that now with you. And I think that the singleness you have said of being very frank, very transparent in your assessment is really is the best best way to start this new uh, partnership that is coming out of 30 years of darkness. Now there's opportunities, and we need to seize those opportunities. So this is not a lost opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's always tricky when we're all trying to do exactly the same thing, um, which is to support Sudan, to, for each of us to say um, something different. Um, and what our role, what our priorities. I think, I think actually, both as the UK and collectively, it's just worth recalling that actually, um, what we as the Friends of Sudan and as the Troika here are, uh, are there to do is to partner the new civilian-led government in Sudan towards sustainability. And I think that sustainability is, it's about peace, as the minister said. It's about economic sustainability, creating a country with which we can all, all trade and where we can invest and, 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 and which is not dependent on others uh, for carrying on. But it's also political sustainability. It's managing those extraordinary tensions and the really tough ride which is ahead now in such a way that we can actually move on from the phase one that the minister has set out so clearly into phase two and phase three and, and, and therefore on, on to sustainability. Um, it is also, I think, uh, within the Friends of Sudan, actually about building new coalitions. Um, I'm slightly the odd one out here because I am, I am the Red Sea and Horn of Africa envoy, not just a Sudan envoy. Um, but actually Sudan is fundamentally critical to what seems to be a, you know, there, there is a new geopolitics, a new regional geopolitics. Sudan is hugely important to a great many people and Sudan's positive future is really important to a lot of people. So I think there is also a role um, which I'm very much focused on is how we can ensure that we, who, and this Troika represents sort of Western donors, Gulf partners, and also regional African partners can work increasingly closely together with Sudan to move forward. Um, on the specifics of what the priorities uh, for the UK are, I think it's I'm, the simple bit, it's, it's freedom, peace and justice. How do we actually support you, Minister, in, in delivering that? Um, you've touched on some of the really big macroeconomic challenges uh, that Sudan faces. Um, so we need to support uh, you, the government, in creating pathways which allow you to have the political sustainability in order to be able to deliver those. You've talked about social safety nets and contracts with people ensuring that actually money is going through in the right ways, right ways. So to help towards that, UK will be really focused, first of all, and in the short term, on technical assistance. And it's really important that we work with all of our international partners on that. We could all separately be offering exactly the same things to the government of Sudan, but actually we all need to offer exactly different things so that it adds up to a collective whole. But technical assistance around a wide range of issues. The second really big issue is the debt relief pathway and how we can sort of work as part of the Paris Club, um, uh, but also much more broadly, a much broader coalition, whether it's arrears clearance for the IFIs or working towards uh, the, the significant debt through the HIPIC process, but working out how we can accelerate that in a sustainable way um, so, and help Sudan to, to make the difficult transitions and decisions and implement the difficult things that will be required to maximise the speed on that. So debt relief, I think, is hugely important. And then lastly, we have all been engaged for a long time and need to continue to be engaged on the humanitarian support, given that 58% of the population is in need, 23% of the population is going to actually need food aid in this coming year, I believe the figure is. But actually, that's not enough because that's not sustainable. It's actually about shifting to development assistance. And, and, and the UK, which already has a development programme, is going to be looking how 
in, in cooperation with all and working in partnership with the government of Sudan is going to be able to significantly build on that development program so that we are paving the way for when I hope sooner rather than later we also begin to see the, um, the, the concessionary finance coming on board which will allow a really big burst forward on that front. Thank you. Okay, as the third envoy, I really uh, may end up repeating a lot of this. But let me just say, uh, in terms of both political and economic support, that the United States very much wants to see this civilian-led transitional government in Sudan succeed. We want to see it succeed in achieving fundamental change in Sudan, to achieve a constitution which will be inclusive of all Sudanese, will enable Sudan to escape the curse that it's had since independence when it's been at war with itself uh, for all but 12 years. Uh, and ultimately to reach a free and fair democratic election so that the government going forward after this transition uh, will have full popular legitimacy. So to go to the issues of peace, justice, and development, uh, on peace, uh, the United States has been a long supporter of the peace negotiations. We've had years and years of technical assistance uh, to the political wings of armed groups to help them organize and try to achieve peace agreements. Uh, that was always stymied by the fact that the partner on the other side of the table was not that interested in achieving peace. Now we see that we have a partner who's very interested in achieving peace. Uh, the actions that the transitional government has taken in response to demands, requests of the armed opposition groups has, has been uh, extremely positive and has resulted in moving forward quickly on, for the first time, a, an agreed cessation of hostilities with the Sudan Revolutionary Front uh, and an agreed framework on the way forward on negotiations. Also, uh, one of the armed groups, the SPLM North, led by Abdulaziz Alhilu, uh, is also now in serious uh, negotiating mode with, with this government. We offered our technical assistance to both government and opposition before this latest round and will continue to support uh, the peace process. Uh, and one of the areas that we're looking to increase uh, our existing assistance area uh, is in uh, peace and reconciliation issues, uh, particularly uh, in Darfur, where we have peace building capacity programs so that as people returned, uh, to their homes, uh, there's an ability to reconcile the communities that are there and those returning. Um, the second, in terms of uh, justice, uh, equally important, uh, the demands that were made uh, yesterday uh, by the demonstrators on the streets of Khartoum, uh, organized by the Sudan Professional Association, was calling for dismantling of the old regime uh, to getting toward justice and accountability. Uh, and those are areas that we will continue to support the Sudanese on. And then on the issue of development, and this, since we have the Minister of Finance here, will spend most of my remarks on that. Um, clearly, prioritization and sequencing of what is done is critical. And that was a big part of the discussion we had in the Friends of Sudan yesterday, uh, to make sure that the very uh, many different elements uh, of assistance of, uh, toward economic reform uh, are taken into account. So first, on humanitarian assistance, where the United States is and remains the largest donor uh, we will continue uh, our role there. And as humanitarian access is being opened up by the government, and many of the issues we have asked to be done to allow unfettered humanitarian access, the government has been very responsive for, uh, toward. So we anticipate we will identify more need and we'll have to uh, probably increase some of the humanitarian funding. Then, as the minister mentioned, this government also needs credibility. It needs to show progress. So he's shared with us uh, 20 proposed projects for quick impact. Uh, we will be sending a mission from the USAID Office of Transition Initiatives uh, out to Khartoum, uh, I think in two weeks, uh, to look at what we can do in terms of quick impact um, so that people can begin to see there's positive change. The government, in order to move forward on a very ambitious program, We'll also need technical assistance in many areas, and that's another area that the United States uh, can play an important role in. Uh, finally, we get to the macroeconomic reform. 
And I must say I'm very heartened by the minister's focus on what Sudan can do to raise its own revenue. Uh, because the numbers in order to do things like exchange rate unification and subsidy elimination are huge. And so a Sudanese contribution is going to be absolutely essential. Uh, and we certainly support the efforts of the government and World Bank uh, to look at a viable uh, social safety net. Uh, in our discussions yesterday in the Friends of Sudan, it was made clear that without that safety net, it would be extremely risky for the government to undertake fundamental economic reforms. And if it doesn't undertake fundamental economic reforms, inflation will continue to mount, poverty will continue to increase, and the population will see this transitional government as having failed it. So it's absolutely critical that we break uh, this cycle. Um, <coughs> It's, uh, let me just say there are two other areas that need to be considered. Um, one, with peace negotiations underway, uh, there will eventually be a need for some sort of a disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program. And Sudan has uh, talked about the need for a security sector reform program. Those are often also expensive items, uh, but things that we will have to consider going forward. And then there's the longer term development, the transformation of the state, uh, which the minister was talking about earlier in terms of uh, trying to bring Sudan really into a knowledge economy basis uh, where growth is not only uh, kick-started but is also sustainable. So let me, uh, I might as well take this point, if I'm not taking too much time, Cameron, uh, to address the minister's comment on the state sponsor of terrorism. Yes, there is that designation that Sudan uh, has had been under for many years now. And it is initiating the process for rescission of that designation is really predicated on an end to support for international terrorism. And that's a factual basis that has to be established. We have uh, to verify that first. It's not in anyone's interest that SST be lifted if indeed there is any sponsorship of terrorism still going on. I'm not saying there is, I'm just saying that this is something we have to be careful to verify. It's a multi-step process and it, Sudan will have to meet the statutory and policy criteria uh, for the lifting of SST. But we clearly understand the significance uh, of the state sponsor of terrorism designation. But I also want to say, as I told the minister on many occasions, it's not the only restriction we have on U.S. assistance to Sudan. There are three congressional acts dating back to 2002, 2004, and 2006, which put in place many overlapping restrictions. And there are a number of other acts that are global in their scope, such as on child soldiers, trafficking in persons, religious freedom, uh, all of which Sudan is subject to sanction under based on the past government. So all of that also has to be uh, addressed and unraveled. Uh, so there are many areas uh, where we have restrictions on what we can do, but I want to assure everyone that the United States government is looking to do the maximum we can uh, given the, uh, the, the legislative restrictions that we have, and we certainly are engaging our Congress uh, to look at uh, how some of those restrictions uh, might be interpreted or even modified going forward. Thank you. Uh, well, there's a huge amount to un unpack there, um, and I'm grateful for the, the candor from all of the uh, from all of the envoys here. Um, I want to shift the conversation to um, something I actually haven't heard about yet, um, and that is the part of the budget and the part of the economy which uh, commands a huge uh, amount of resources, but has probably the least transparency, uh, and that's the part of the budget that has gone to security operations and security forces. Um, I assume you have a better control or better say, uh, or at least better visibility on what the budget numbers are right now and, and, and how those monies have been spent uh, in the past. My question is, how do you begin to both bring transparency to this budget, privatize the peristatals that the NIS and the SAF own, uh, get rid of the concessions that they have been afforded over time. I mean, these are sort of the uh, the cash cows of, of a security state. How do you begin to dismantle such a large portion of the economy? How do you, how do you bring it under uh, state control, and how do you do it in a way um, that doesn't break too many eggs uh, in doing it? Okay. 
thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think um, the the first the first step was actually to look at the exemptions uh, and the loopholes in the tax system, uh, and we have done that. And actually now, the uh, recommendations are uh, submitted. They are submitted to the to the ministry. Some of these recommendations require legislative reform because the past regime have actually protected these, uh, you know, sacred cows, so to speak, with, uh, you know, uh, an ensemble of, uh, of legislation to shield them from the oversight uh, of the Ministry of Finance and the tax system. Uh, so this is the first step. The second step, we also have another task force reviewing about more than 400 uh, public companies, including companies that uh, uh, are considered, you know, operating in the dark. We don't really have any problems with parastatals, uh, whether military or non-military, that are actually operating in the open and subject to competition and pay taxes uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, to in terms of their export proceeds to be known and possibly shared uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, the the economic authorities. Uh, we have already started uh, what I would like to call uh, a discreet but uh, frank and responsible, uh, uh, you know, discussions with our partners. And I would really like to say something here, which I think is of significance for us as Sudanese. I think. Despite uh, all the misgivings that surrounded the ups and downs of the revolution, I think the Sudanese military establishment should be given credit for siding eventually with the population, especially if we take into account what has happened in the countries around us. Because as one Sudanese scholar described the revolution as that this is a glorious revolution, peaceful revolution, but did not manage to topple the regime by uh, a one knockdown or uh, you know knockout shot. Uh, it took the military to avoid uh, a blood a blood uh, a bloodbath, and that is something that is very significant because these generals these were the generals who worked under the old regime and under the former president. But then when they saw that the determination of the Sudanese population, they took action. And I think we should appreciate this. Uh, I can tell you that actually, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, the leadership of the military and the civilian government is very cordial, uh, very considerate. And in fact, we are not only talking about, uh, you know, the these institutions and the companies and so on, we are talking about the entire sector of the gold mining, and uh, we are opening a, a process and a dialogue on this, and I think we will be able to reach a satisfactory, uh, you know, uh, uh, agreement on how best we can actually uh, introduce transparency and accountability, uh, and we are working on that. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the especially after the attempted coup which was the last hurrah of the hidden cells of the Muslim Brotherhood in the army, which was actually fortunately uh, was, uh, you know, uh, discovered and, and foiled in, in the right time. And it was a very serious, by the way, very serious coup that uh, could have actually uh, took the country into a bloodbath. Uh, I think Increasingly now, the two partners, they see themselves uh, intertwined. They are on the same boat. And I think that is very good for uh, the future of democracy uh, in Sudan. And I would like to suggest that perhaps uh, in a month or two from now, it will become very clear that uh, there are certain decisions that will uh, resolve these issues of trans lack of transparency right now. The share of the of the military in the budget uh, is about 70% of chapter one, which comes to about 22%. Uh, 
Uh, and simply because uh, the country was in the state of war and uh, it was a military budget. So we hope that when we transit to uh, a peace budget, uh, as uh, uh, Ambassador Bush suggested, there will be uh, you know, uh, a one shot of increase uh, in, the, uh, in the allocation for the DDR. But then eventually, especially if we manage to, to raise the fiscal effort and also get the pledges from, especially from the Arab funds about uh, uh, financing uh, the investment part of the budget, I think the share of the military appropriation uh, will be close to normal. Because right now, the share of the military budget uh, is about, the military uh, allocation to the budget is about almost five times the average for Africa, which is quite significant and not sustainable and not acceptable. But I think once this uh, situation of the uh, peace has uh, you know, reached its uh, final conclusion, there will not be any excuse actually to maintain that, uh, that kind of uh, budget structure. Um, your colleagues want to add anything to to what kind of uh, prioritization you would give that, or how how we external partners can can support this kind of really delicate transformation. If not, I have another question. <laughs> I want to actually talk about non troika partners here, and the minister just mentioned Gulf uh, Gulf financing for for some of his programs. Um, I know that all of you have been uh, in the Gulf in your capacity uh, in the past few months. I want to ask about um, the role of Gulf partners in this, uh, because I think at the beginning uh, of the revolution, it was unclear what role they would they would play uh, going forward. Um, and I'm just curious as to your perspectives now on the role um, they are playing, what they view as uh, uh, the best outcome for Sudan, for the Sudanese, but also for their own uh, national interests. And you, Minister, how you view, uh, because again, we heard from many of the protesters uh, and still continue to hear uh, from many of the people in the streets um, that they are reticent to take Gulf financing and to take uh, handouts from the Gulf, as it's been called. Um, and I'm curious how you strike that balance between um, engaging uh, a needed financier uh, and respecting um, the popular view that uh, Sudan is perhaps, perhaps too much in the in, in in the Gulf orbit. So, a question for for the whole for the whole panel. I don't know if our, our envoys want to take it first. And Julian, since you have that in, uh, lead us off. Okay, is that on? No, I have to. Very good. Right. Um, I mean, I'm going to begin answering this question actually by just reflecting back on the last one, if I may. Um, where I think uh, that what the minister said is really important. Transparency is, is key. Um, and I think on that you know, military budget and who owns what in the economy, actually I think we need to, all of us, recognise the importance of, of a consensual and mediated shift of control and power uh, the control of resource so that it is flowing ever increasingly towards a properly structured budget um, under the control of a finance minister um, and uh, but but that's working so I mean hearing that there is a, a conversation and a dialogue on, on on gold mining and how the resources of that work is is hugely encouraging the reason I wanted to mention that as a prelude to what I was saying is that it strikes me that the key for all of this is that everything needs to be on budget and coming through a single treasury account, etc., including inflows of foreign exchange, etc., wherever they may be earned and however they may be earned. And I think um, that obviously goes for finance from the Gulf, just like it goes from finance from any of us. And Therefore, you know, I mean, I mentioned in my uh, first remarks, um, the Gulf countries I see as absolutely critical partners for Sudan. 
I do not think that those of us um, represented up here at the moment as donors could deliver what Sudan needs alone. And I don't think uh, that the Gulf can deliver what they would like to see alone. So actually partnerships, <laughs> the new structures of the world uh, require partnerships. Um, we all, however much we love Sudan, work with Sudan also for the furtherance of our own interests. Um, and actually, when I go to Riyadh or Abu Dhabi or anywhere else, actually, and, and, and actually different but a close neighbour, Cairo, I mean, everybody is interested in security, stability and prosperity, prosperity, and the security, stability and prosperity of Sudan and how that impacts on them. Sudan is crucial to regional stability and, you know, the terrorism issue has been something to run for a long time. We've got Daesh in all sorts of different places uh, and, 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 and with changing dynamics that could rush anywhere. We've seen piracy in the red, well, in more in the Gulf of Aden, south around Somalia. People are worried about that. There's people, sort of unregulated migration. You've got the risks from the Sahel. Sudan is part of a solution for that that really, really matters to the Gulf as well. Um, so I think those are a really legitimate set of interests that the Gulf have. And what I am seeing and the conversations I am having is a shift from old traditional ways of delivering that, which worked in the past, which are no longer fit for purpose. And the fact that, you know, our Gulf friends are part of the Friends of Sudan is necessary and it's an important signal that actually we are all participating together. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think that the, there are clear and reasonable interests which are being served through different kinds of partnerships and we, we need to how to work out how to make that work. And what I would say is even beyond Sudan, if we can make it work for Sudan, which is crucial for all of us, including Sudan, it actually all sets a new model for the future. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I'll be very brief. I just want to reinforce the, the, you know, Julian's uh, re you know, emphasis on uh, you know, what's, what's good for the Sudan is also good for the Gulf now. You want stability. They all want stability. The way to get stability is to support the revolution, to build you know, prosperity, to build you know, democracy, to build uh, strong institutions that can withstand. You know, a frank assessment as the history of the engagement of many Gulf countries in the Sudan is that they have lost a lot of money. They're in a sense, they backed the wrong horse. Now they have an opportunity to, be, to back the people and, and support the revolution, and that will give them what, what they want in, in the long term. And it's also a test you know, for the future, you know, to see, OK, the good the old ways didn't work out. Now let's, let's try something else. Let's do it better. And it will be good. You know, and, and this, again, is where we can come in. I haven't been to the Gulf countries yet. I will go there very soon. What I will say is that we very much appreciate the support you have given. We very much you appreciate your willingness to help the people of Sudan. We will much, very much in, in, in welcome your willingness to work with us, as you did yesterday in the uh, Friends of Sudan uh, people. But it's not over yet. You know, We have to stay on this track, and we have a common interest in this. And by the way, common interest is one of our slogans for the Security Council. <laughs> <laughs> that was a plug for Norway's seat on the Security Council. Yes. <laughs> I think, uh, Cameron, your comment that uh, some in the street in Khartoum and in Sudan more broadly were reticent to take uh, money from the Gulf. I think that was certainly true um, in, in May and June uh, when uh, it was the generals who were showing up in Riyadh and showing up in Abu Dhabi. And it certainly gave the signal that the support was behind the very people that the street was trying to move out of power. I think that's changed now, and I think the support from the Gulf to the transitional government uh, has been very welcomed by the Sudanese people. It's a matter now of making sure that that's done effectively and as transparently as possible. In my discussions with uh, our Gulf friends recently, uh, I've detected a lot of flexibility on their part in how they will deliver assistance that they promised uh, and went to work with the minister uh, and his team uh, to make that most useful for Sudan. Uh, to make this transition a success. Uh, let's face it, in the beginning, 
if you're looking for stability and you're looking to keep the old regime from coming back into power, the first impulse of the Gulf is not going to be to support a disorganized, seemingly leaderless, youth and women-led street protest. Um, so there was engagement that the Troika had. Um, we operate also the UK and the US uh, through the Quad uh, with uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And we've had uh, many discussions with them. And I think now they do realize uh, and support the notion that the, the best investment is to indeed, as, as Andre said, support the people of Sudan. That's where you get stability. That's where you have your uh, barrier against the resurgence of the uh, type of regime that Bashir and Hassan Tarabi brought to power. Do you want to comment at all on your relationship with the Gulf? Yes, I think, uh, well, it's always easy to, uh, you know, um, let me say that actually just the diversity of opinions I think is something good uh, that actually now we reach uh, a level of uh, uh, openness and a level of tolerance that we can actually get uh, a wide range of views. And, but however, I think these views might be extreme or you know, moderate or objective. I think we believe that this government continues to receive a very strong popular support and mandate. And to the extent that this government uh, is a government of the revolution, even if uh, other partners would like actually to promote certain uh, you know, policies or ideas or so on, we cannot really actually uh, you know, you know, uh, acquiesce to this unless we have the support of the Sudanese people, because now there is free media, there is investigative journalism, and so on. Uh, and as Ambassador who said, I think, for example, I accompanied the, the two presidents, president of the uh, Council of Sovereignty and the Prime Minister, uh, to the um, mission to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And I could not really see any kind of uh, patronizing, uh, trying to patronize the government or to steal, to steer the government in one direction or the other. Actually, I think the discussion have always been about uh, common interest. And in fact, if anything, it has focused on investment and actually coordinating joint uh, investment by uh, Sudanese private sector and the uh, and the and the and the private sector uh, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and I think this is exactly what we are looking for. And uh, I'm not worried at all about uh, uh, any concerns about uh, our independence or uh, free political choice, because even if the government want to do it in this atmosphere, it will not be able to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, we're in a, I think, small enough room that we're just going to ask you to stand and, and uh, sort of speak loudly and uh, ask your question. Um, we are webcasting, so I might repeat it so it gets picked up. Um, and why don't I take two at a time? And if you have uh, someone you want to direct it to, uh, say that as well. Let me go here in the front to Leslie and here on the side. You can just stand up and just. Shout it out. I'll repeat it if we need okay. to. Um, sorry about that. Um, hi, Dr. Abadani. Good to see you again. Um, so my question is for you. Um, so Ambassador Booth mentioned some of the technical and financial assistance that the U.S. could offer. But in addition, one of the ways that the government of the United States can help Sudan through this transition is through not only removing it from the state sponsor of terrorism list, but offering debt relief. And both of those require a role for Congress. And so I'm curious as to, in your conversations with these, uh, the military members of the government, um, you, know, you referred to up to 70% of the budget being off book, being you know, untraceable fi financing. Um, in your conversations with the military uh, elements of the government, are you linking fiscal transparency, so transparency of the security sector, to eventual removal from the state sponsor of terrorism list, because it might be a bit of a tough sell in the US if, if there's not fiscal transparency of the security sector, how are people to know 
that elements of the old regime are not supporting terrorism. And the second point is, um, are you linking fiscal transparency of the security sector to eventual debt relief? Because it, would, it could be a tough sell for the United States to offer an appropriation for debt relief if there's not transparency in you know, how money is being spent in the security sector. So one second, you can think on that, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the second question. What is the plan for the parastatals um, mm -hmm. that are owned by the NIS and the and the and the SAP, the, the sort of the shadow companies that they own? The, because the RSF said we don't need government funds, presumably because they're taking in funds off book. Okay. Yes, actually, just a correction. Uh, the share of the military uh, budget is 21 percent, because it's 70 percent of Chapter One. Uh, yeah, so it is uh, chapter one accounts for 30 percent of the budget. So 0.7 multiplied by 30 would give you 21 percent. That is actually the official share in the budget. But uh, you know, obviously, uh, I would like just to say something which is very important, which is that actually there is what what we call in in, in economics hysteresis. The hysteresis is a physical phenomena. If you actually, uh, you know, press a rubber and then the rubber will not go back to its normal shape immediately, <laughs> right? So we have a regime that has ruled for 30 years, and a culture and a system and so on. Uh, so, and this is especially directly to the second question, that the old regime uh, actually used to operate in silos, you know, uh, and the Ministry of Finance uh, was really substantially undermined. In fact, even the central bank wa was uh, and is still buying gold and, uh, you know, doing things which a central bank should not do. And, uh, and so you have a situation where the RSF was actually doing things that are sanctioned by the state and, and, and actually operating in order to finance its activities. Uh, since the revolution, which I know for sure, is that whatever the RSF receives is deposited at the central bank. It's still not as part of the budget, but at least it's known. And as I said, there is a process whereby we will be actually uh, engaging all actors, including actors that are sovereign such as the, you know, the military institutions and so on, that we have to have public monies uh, and assets actually accounted for, and, 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 and there is a full oversight by the Ministry of Finance. Or at least the Minister of Finance should actually have the full account of what is going on. And we are working on that. Uh, and I think, uh, as I said, it's important to understand that this government only has one month and a half just one month and a half. And uh, we have to grapple with so many issues, including reviewing the, the, the constitutional declaration in order to appoint the chief justice. And, uh, and, 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 and we made history that we have now a woman chief justice. You know, we broke the, the glass ceiling twice for uh, uh, you know, a minister of uh, foreign affairs, uh, a woman minister of foreign affairs and a woman, you know, so I think these things will happen, and not only because of the, by the way, because of the, uh, you know, uh, improving our chances of, 
you know, uh, of, uh, of being delisted from the SSTL, even though this is a very strong motivation. But it is also good for our country. You know, I mean, uh, a modern economy cannot really survive with lack of transparency uh, in the budget and no priorities for setting a budget process and what have you. In fact, the current budget for 2020 will be based on a, on a very modern style, which is an SDG-based style. And I'm very happy that actually uh, I have an opportunity to talk to one of the leading economists in the world who is actually working now uh, with the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department to actually uh, design a budget that is based on SGG. And Sudan is, is going to be one of the case studies uh, in order to actually give us capacity building and technical training as to how uh, from now on we prepare our budget uh, according to an SGD criteria. So I think it is important, uh, as you said, for the sake of uh, improving uh, and enhancing our chances to, to get access to IDA and also to get debt relief. But I think, and that's a strong motivation, but I think even from the perspective of our own national agenda, it's very important we do this. Uh, because if we didn't do this, eventually, the economy uh, will actually uh, reach a, you know, a grinding halt, and either another coup will come or another revolution will come. Can I just follow up on the first question, which is, does, do your partners in the military, do they understand all of this? Do they understand, uh, because bringing all of that shadow economy into the light, they're the ones that are going to suffer the most from, from that process. Do they understand that preventing that from going forward impacts them on the state sponsor of terrorism delisting, uh, on the IDA uh, flows, uh, on the sort of the, do they understand the, the enormous reputational impact that that has for bringing in new investment? Have they made that connection? Because clearly you have. Well, it's then our responsibility. It's the responsibility of the prime minister the, the responsibility of the finance minister without any uh, uh, patronizing or appearing to be educating very proud military leaders is to engage them in a conversation because they also have something to offer in this conversation. But I, I, I can assure you that we have already started such a conversation, but I have to come here. The prime minister have to visit some countries for critical business. We only have one month and a half. I think we, <laughs> I think I think we will continue the conversation with our military, and uh, you know I might appear to be like either naive or optimistic, but I can tell you from my own personal experience, attending uh, joint meetings with the Council of Sovereignty, with uh, military component in there, uh, and the Council of uh, Ministers, uh, I can see that things have started to evolve in a very positive way. Andrew, you want to make a point? Uh, just allow me to two brief comments on this. If you, you see how everything links to everything, if you bring the security sector under control, you're going to give a use boost, confidence build, building boost in the peace negotiations, because that's what the rebels are afraid of. You know these continued practices of these various groups that have not been controlled now. So, so that's one thing. Now, it's not only the say, security forces, the military, and so on that didn't pay pay taxes. In the private sector also didn't pay taxes, didn't like to pay taxes, partly because they didn't like the government. Um, I don't know so many people in the rapid support forces, but I do know people in Sudan in the private sector. And we talked when I was in Khartoum just over a week ago about this tax issue, and they said, well, you know, they have received directions from the top now to be much more careful in, you know, in following the rules on this. So there is a mentality change now because people starting believing in the direction that the Sudan is going in. So, so, so I just wanted to bring that into the discussion as well. Thank you. We had one question here and then in the front. So uh, question is to Minister Ibrahim. Uh, but first I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ambassador Booth and Mr. Brian Shukan with the new Charge Affair in Sudan, as well as the previous Charge Affair, Stephen Kutzer, for their tremendous support to the Sudanese government and to the Sudanese people over the last three years. And special thanks to Ambassador uh, Fabrizio Lobasso for supporting the people. So thank you for that. Grazie. Um, my question is, 
uh, removing Sudan from the state sponsor of terrorism is quite difficult uh, because it overlaps so many different issues with the uh, international and against the act and things like that. What advice would you give to your successor in making sure that things like this don't happen again and it moves in the right direction? Thank you. Thanks, Tim Carney. I think, Minister, you and your colleagues have properly put an accent on building a social safety net to protect the poorest from the fiscal and monetary reforms that are absolutely necessary to get your economy uh, underway. The problem, as I understand it, is that the bank and the fund cannot give the government any money because of the level of debt. They might be able to give the private sector funds if the private sector is willing to help build that social safety net. Have you considered a role for the Sudanese private sector in this effort? Okay. Uh, I think the question about the successor fair is right. Of course, you know, the successor in this case has to be the president or the prime minister. The finance minister does not really uh, uh, have the capacity to commit uh, uh, actions that would. Uh, to avoid to avoid being listed, yeah. or yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. That the the, the God forbid relisting Sudan again <laughs> would take. <laughs> Would take more than more than the finance minister, <laughs> but but my answer would be actually to stick to democracy, because democracy uh, is the only political system that ensures transfer of power peacefully from one uh, you know group to another, from one uh, party to another. And as uh, one of our uh, former prime ministers said, this is the most important contribution of Western democracy that has never happened in the history of humanity. Because there were technology before, there were so many things, but there have never been uh, a, a stable, trans peaceful transfer of power uh, in the history of humanity before. And, uh, and, and, and we take whatever good things humanity produce and adopt it. And I think to stick to democracy is really the lesson for us uh, as Sudanese people, especially given our diversity. Uh, in fact, I remember a while back at the World Bank, we did a study uh, and produced a report ca called Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? And we came to the conclusion that uh, the Asian, the historical Asian state experience of building a strong economy in an otherwise authoritarian system, and then until the middle class become strong enough and then force a transition to democracy, is not this experience is not transferable to Africa or even the Middle East because of the diversity of the societies. That a, a dictatorship will be captured by a subnational uh, community, uh, either sectarian or tribal or something, and then the state will no longer be a developmental state. And I think that's a very important lesson for us uh, in Sudan, given our diversity. Uh, as for the question, uh, I think, of course, you know, uh, we are actually, uh, you know, we haven't really thought about strongly courting the private sector we should do, but we are actually banking on the Sudanese diaspora. And uh, in fact, the Minister of Finance will be announcing uh, a deposit fund for the Sudanese diaspora, which is uh, could be recover, recover, uh, to be recovered uh, or retained before the end of the transitional period. Uh, and, this, and this fund will be deposited at the central bank to prop up the reserves of the central bank because it is very critical for the stability of the exchange rate regime. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, despite the SST, which remains a, an important objective for us to be delisted, we are working with the World Bank to see if we can actually chart uh, a parallel path uh, towards uh, a rear clearance. Uh, as well as access to IDA eventually, but we 
we are now very careful to explore the possibility of not complicating the other paths to uh, debt relief. Uh, and we are working with uh, our colleagues uh, at the World Bank on this. Uh, and we hope that once we reach, uh, as well as the U.S. Treasury, uh, so we're hoping that if we reach some sort of uh, a good understanding that this path can be pursued, we will pursue this as a Ministry of Finance or as an economic sector in the government, while our other colleagues, you know, working on, on, on other issues on the SST. So, you know, we'll see where we, where we will be, uh, if we will be successful in that. Just a very brief observation, actually, which was picking up on, on, on the Minister's remark about diversity and the importance of democracy in such a diverse country. And it actually just made me think back to earlier remarks about um, the key challenges of this government being peace and the economy. And I just wanted to sort of say how much discussion has focused uh, recently on the, f the need to focus on the periphery as well as just on Khartoum and make sure that as we are building up development programs, working with the government, we're taking those right out to the places which have been most afflicted by conflict. Um, not least because actually if we begin to address the root causes which have caused people to support armed opposition, actually the need to wish to support armed opposition begins to dissipate because the people are getting their answer from the centre. And, and through that, which also then makes it much easier to have a, a, a realizable peace process which gets there faster. Great. Can we take one more round of one more round of questions because we're running short on time. The gentleman in, all the way in the back there, yeah, here, and then uh, right here in the front, yeah. There's a uh, Let's keep our questions brief though because we are uh, we are right up against our uh, our time. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Hi everybody, uh, Dr. Abraham Al Mahari. Um, let me. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry. Let me speak to you frankly. Uh, I don't have any shadow of doubt in my mind that, uh, uh, without sugar coated, yeah, I don't have any shadow of doubt in my mind that you are one of the di distinguished uh, economists in uh, the space of Sudan and African continent as well. Yet we have fully understand that you are not a snake charmer to fix this regressive economic situation in a few months. My question to you, do you have any uh, hidden intention to lift uh, subsidies from uh, uh, basic commodities in the near future in order to uh, support a vulnerable segment financially? And are you able to cover all the uh, uh, vulnerable segment in Sudan, especially um, the, the, the poverty is, is increasing drastically and beyond your imagination. That's number one. The second question, if you don't mind enlightening us or give us uh, uh, a spiritual insight what the cause of Sudanese economic uh, and it is a structure that uh, led to this chronic uh, uh, crisis, which is crippled from uh, pr recovering or delayed from uh, uh, prosperity. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I can speak. Thank you for the event. Thank you. Yesterday, people went to the protest on the street, and thousands of military have been de 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 employed, deployed inside Khartoum Street with a very heavy tanks inside the city. Security is the basic form for every people to be development or economic or everything. This is the same question that everyone is asking all over the Sudan. My number one question is that what are the emergency? Major, but has tied to the, the security sector reforms that we have taken so far. Number two is we know that the 
the, the military coup in 1989, what happened one month before was the transition of the, the elected government was opening filing from bank called Tadaman Bank and uh, uh, Faisal Islamic Bank, because these banks are part of Islamic movement back inside Iraq. And because of that, they make a military coup for avoiding. Thanks. So we know the parallel state, which has a private security, it has private institutes, <coughs> national military industrial complex, mining sector, and other big companies that are part of the party or part of popular defense force or national. If you want to reform the private sector, where do you put this group, this institution, which are very organized and very ideological affiliated in the Thank you. Did you get both of those? I, I, I took them one is the sort of the prioritization for removing subsidies uh, and how quickly you can how quickly you can you can do that and then the second one about reforming both the private sector and the uh, the financing of the of the of the military sector as well. Okay. Yes, actually uh, the issue of the subsidy uh, I will be very frank, but also very truthful. Uh, we are not intending at all, at all, to lift the subsidies and stop there. So it is not in our uh, jargon to say we are lifting the subsidy. We are actually graduating or transiting from subsidizing commodities that are actually only relevant to a few people, mainly in the capital. Let me give you an example. Uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, subsidized 100,000 sack of uh, flour wheat every day at the price of 550 pounds per sack, while the 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 the, the, the free market price is more than 1,200. This 100,000 uh, sacks. About um, 47, uh, is it uh, sorry, 47? 47,000 of which are consumed by Khartoum. And the remainder is 53 for the rest of Sudan. And even then, some many anecdotal evidence suggests that this 53,000 does not find itself uh, through various, uh, you know, corruptive and uh, incompetent means and so, uh, factors and so on to the rest of the country. And the same also apply for the, for the oil. Uh, and we are trying to do, the government is trying to do our best. But like any subsidy program, it is fraught with, with corruption and, uh, and problems. So the idea is that and not only that, this is because of very generous, we are able to do it because of a ge very generous uh, assistance from the two brotherly governments of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, and so we are doing it as long as we are uh, important or being loved by some people who are willing to, <laughs> to foot the bill. Uh, is this the future for Sudan? Is this something that we really want? So I think what we really want is different. What we really want, and I know that the that the revolutionary youth uh, would not really condone such kind of uh, uh, you know of, of lifestyle for for the Sudanese. That's why we are preparing ourselves now in terms of improving the fiscal policy, in terms of uh, you know uh, building you know, establishing the institutions of economic transparency and accountability. And we are also talking to our partners in the military establishment and assuming that uh, who, as well as dealing with our partners in the multilateral institutions and bilateral institutions through the Friends of Sudan. For example, to give you an example, one of the key projects we are looking to get support in is to in, uh, you know, overhaul the public transport system in Khartoum and the other cities. Because we cannot ask the middle class uh, in Khartoum who owns cars that we are now going to charge the international prices, which we should do. But before we do some alternative, giving them some alternative so that they can use the transport system. And we consider this, and, and there are so many other examples which time would not allow to give. 
So our plan is that in the second half of 2020, we start uh, as you know, kind of a gradual process of lifting the subsidies, but only after we institute the social safety net. And the social safety net will be almost like a universal basic income transfer, you know, where we will actually establish a payment system. People who live in the cities will have to open accounts, those who are eligible, and they will be having direct transfers. And there will be some very useful and interesting concepts, such as members of the household who are less than 18 years old, we will transfer the, the money to the mother rather than the father, for obvious reasons, that the mothers are the one responsible <laughs> for the welfare of the, uh, of the society and the welfare of the household. Uh, I think some people will lose. You know, people have three, four cars in Khartoum, uh, poor Sudan, and Uwait, and they get, you know, below, way below the, you know, actually electricity and, and fuel in Sudan is one of the cheapest in the world. So we cannot afford that. So our message is that we have to be frank, we have to tell people, but then we are not really in the business of causing more pain uh, to Sudanese people who have already paid a lot. We will get, uh, inshallah, I will say, we will get the enough resources uh, in order to actually uh, you know, deliver uh, a credible social safety net. And that, only after we do that, and in fact, uh, in our plan, <coughs> we'll make the transfer for two months or so with the subsidy before we eventually lift it so that people can believe us, people can have faith that the government uh, is capable of doing it, and so that they see the cash coming to their accounts or uh, through mobile money. Uh, and this is a huge exercise. And in fact, we plan to challenge the youth that actually the youth have made this revolution. Now uh, support the Sudanese economy by mobilizing yourself, doing the survey, and, 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 and let us, in a scientific and transparent way, select those Sudanese families that really deserve to be supported. So this is our, uh, this is our plan. And I think with regard to the second question, uh, you, know, you know, I will remind you of the, of the hysteresis example. You know, if, if you press the rubber, you have to give it some time to go back to the natural shape. We are working and we are engaging our partners and I'm pretty sure that we will uh, very time soon reach some closure because unless we do that, I think everybody will lose, including the military establishment itself. We've, we've run out of time, but uh, there's clearly so much more to say and discuss. Um, but I want to thank you, Mr. Minister, and for all three of the Troika envoys for your candor, uh, because I thought it was a very frank conversation, but also your commitment to Sudan and to making sure that this revolution stays uh, on the rails and continues. I would love to see you here in uh, 12 months at the next bank fund round of meetings when you've had 14 months in office uh, to tell us how far along you are in uh, in this very ambitious and Herculean set of reforms you've uh, you've laid out for us today. So please welcome, uh, thank, help me, welcome, thank you, Arsene S. <laughs>